over three in the afternoon. <laughs> so I'll cover everything. <laughs> now, before uh, I go on to discuss a little bit about the, uh, the uh, evidence for black holes, let me complete what we were seeing yesterday. And because some of you were concerned about some of the things that I was doing, let me point out, number one, So we were reducing the problem to a single ODE, okay, for the fields, for some master function. It could be a scalar, it could be a vector, or it could be a, a tensor, the gravitational waves. In the case of gravity, what you should do, so I, I told you how we decompose uh, uh, metric fluctuations in tensorial spherical harmonics. And the way you do, so if you have initial data, if you prescribe just initial conditions, everything I said goes through. If instead you want to focus on some non-vanishing stress energy tensor, so you, you do exactly the same, right? So you take the field equations, you linearize them around some background solution. In, so suppose, for instance, you have a small black hole or a neutron star falling into a supermassive guy, okay? Then the background is vacuum, so you're going to expand your metric around the background, which is Schwarzschild, and then you're taking linearizations of that. So your correct metric is going to be the background plus some fluctuation, right? You're going to expand G mu nu up to linear order in H, okay? And you're assuming that the neutron star or small black hole contributes something that scales like H. So, so at the end, you're going to write something like this. Uh, K, and this would be the stress tensor of your point particle, okay? We know how to do this now, right? We decompose this in tensor spherical harmonics. We project this on those harmonics, and you get a set of coupled equations. The notebook that I sent you basically shows how to separate and decouple all the equations. So at the end, you're still going to get a single ODE for, for evolving the problem, okay? So with some source term. Okay, so this is note number one. Note number two is that even, uh, so suppose we do this for a point particle, okay? So I take a small black hole of mass mu. You could think of this, for instance, as a small black hole of a solar mass falling into a supermassive black hole with 10 to the 6 solar masses. These systems exist, and we know we're going to see them in the future. Okay? And this is fine, because now we have a guy which is a million times smaller and less massive than the other. So I can apply, I can use this procedure. Okay? Now, let me tell you that this works astonishingly well even when you extrapolate to equal mass systems. So for example, if you do the calculations, they're in the notebook, the radiated energy, when you throw a small black hole into a more massive uh, guy, is something like this, mu squared over m, okay? So of course, smaller masses, the less the energy you get. If you extrapolate this to the equal mass case by promoting mu to be the reduced mass of the system, then you're going to find that the radiated energy gives you something like this. 6.5 times 10 to the minus 4 m. This is purely perturbation theory, okay? We should not be even allowed to do this, okay? Just a wild extrapolation. If you do this using numerical relativity, so evolving non-linearly the full system, then you find that you're going to get 5.7 times 10 to the minus 4 m. So you see, even in this wild extrapolation, you're within 20% of the answer. So this is what you should, if you have your preferred theory and you want to see how gravitational waves are emitted, how they work, this is what you should do. Before plugging everything in the computer, try to understand the problem at linearized level first, okay? 
I don't think we know why, by the way, why this happens, why all the nonlinearities that should occur in truly equal mass systems are washed away. One of the possible reasons is connected to the light ring. It, it kind of prevents uh, radiation from escaping, but, but this is unknown. Okay. So yesterday we, we were looking at scattering of waves of vacuoles and the collision of particles with vacuoles. Okay? And we saw that generically the late time signal is something like that. It's a ring down and we try to understand the ring down in terms of a superposition of complex exponentials. Let me give you an example which is a very clean and I think neat example. So I'm going to replace my effective potential okay, by a, a simple delta function. So I'll be working in Minkowski, one dimension, just a delta function for the potential, and see what, what, what comes out. So I'll, I'll be working with this. Psi. So remember, this was basically what we showed yesterday. Here we had an effective potential. I'm just making sure it's localized. Okay? And then there was some source term, which was basically related to the initial data. I'm going to assume that the time, the momentum is zero. I only have the wave function at t equals zero. So the source term looks something like that. Okay? To be able to solve this nicely, I will also assume that the initial data, the, the initial configuration is localized. So this guy is a delta, okay? So I have a delta function, the potential at x zero, and I'm going to release a delta function at x equals x naught. Very trivial example. Now, all the wave functions we defined, the nice wave function on the left, which is outgoing, the nice wave function on the right, we can write them down, and they, they're like this. Psi L is e to the minus i omega x on the left. It's a in e to the minus i omega x plus a out e to the plus i omega x when x goes to infinity. I can get these coefficients now, right? All I need to do is, so remember, we have this problem, x, zero, there's the delta function, at x naught, I release my data. The only thing I need to do now is require, well, continuity of the wave function here, and use this equation of motion to get the jump, okay? So I find, if you demand continuity, then you find that one is equal to a in plus a out, this is basically, well, because at x zero, this has to be equal. And the jump, so you integrate across the delta function at x zero, gives you psi prime between plus and minus epsilon, some small distance around zero, has to be 2 v naught psi at zero. Okay? So you, you find one is equal to a in plus a out, and a out minus a in plus one is equal to two v naught over i omega, okay? The Ronskin is very easy to compute now. The Ronskin between the two solutions is really just two i omega minus two v naught. So immediately you find quasi-normal frequencies. Remember from yesterday, the quasi-normal frequencies are the poles, basically the zeros of the Ronskin. So this tells you immediately that omega QNM is minus I V naught. So it happens that there's a single quasi-normal frequency for this system. But, but, but it's there. Okay. And if V naught is positive, the system is stable. Okay? It's minus I. So as time goes by, the, the fluctuation damps away. Very good. The solution, we also saw how to write down the time domain solution. So it was something like this. 
Uh, so, I, so first I started to com I start by computing the uh, solution in Fourier space, which was just an integral with the source at large distances. We found this, dx psi L i omega. So this is the initial data over the Ronskin. Okay, but this is a delta function, so the integral is trivial. So this is e to the i omega x i omega over the Ronskin a in e to the minus i omega x naught plus a out e to the i omega x naught. So this is done. So in Fourier space we're done. We can invert now, right? And if you invert, we need to do an integral in the omega space, in frequency space, so we find psi, so this is the time domain function, is one over two pi, integral of e to the minus i omega t, times this guy, the omega, and now we substitute, right? And you see immediately that these integrals are relatively easy, right? So these are one over two pi, integral of e to the i omega, x minus x naught minus t over two, plus one over two pi, integral in the omega, e to the i omega, x plus x naught minus t, a out over two, a in, okay? Very good. But a delta this is basically just a delta function, right? This is the Fourier representation of a delta function, delta of, uh, of x minus a is basically this. Okay? So the first term, this term, is going to give me a delta function, and this is what I was referring to as the, the prompt contribution. So this is kind of the Minkowski analog of the on-light cone propagation. So this would be, then I find psi is this guy. It's one half delta of x minus x naught minus t plus one over two pi integral in the omega of minus i v naught over omega over two, so I re, I'm rearranging some terms, over omega, e to the i omega, x plus x naught minus t. Okay? Now, how do we do this? Well, we close the contour. There's a single pole. The pole is exactly at the quasi-normal frequency. So the only thing we need to evaluate is the residue. And we're going to find we're going to find that psi is one half of delta x minus x naught minus t plus let me rearrange again that term one over four pi in the wrong, the omega minus i v naught over omega plus i v naught e to the i omega x plus x naught minus t. Okay? So the pole is here, minus i v naught. At small time, so if t, so this is minus, okay? If t is smaller than x plus x naught, you can close the contour on the upper half plane there's no poles there. So you can close it because this guy goes to zero when you close it at large omega, right? If you close it with a large semicircle, this term goes to zero, so you get nothing. There's no poles here. So so for t smaller than x plus x naught, psi is only one half of delta 
x minus x naught minus t. What is this? Well, we started with this problem, okay? Initial, so we're, somebody's there, plugs the field, and I'm observing here, okay? The first term tells me simply that a half of the initial data is traveling at the speed of light towards me. So that's fine. Now, what I would expect is that the other half is traveling to the left, right? So there's another half traveling this way. It interacts with the potential barrier. And some time after that, actually, I know precisely the time, right? It's the time it takes to get from here to here plus twice this time. I should get something. And you do get something because you find that for t larger than x plus x naught, the field is psi equals one half of delta x minus x naught minus t plus the residue contribution, which is v naught over 2 e to v naught x plus x naught minus t at these times. Okay? So you see, this is very nice because this is precisely the QNM contribution. It's decaying away in time precisely at the quasi-normal frequency rate. Okay? That, that's controlling the decay of the fluctuation. Okay? Of course, it's a very special example in the sense that you're able to compute very precisely the, the amplitude with which you excite the mode of the barrier, okay? But for black holes, basically the same thing happens, or any other compact object. Instead of a delta function, potentially you get some effective thing, but the picture is always the same. You get a prompt contribution from the initial data, then it goes, it, the other half tries to go into the black hole, it excites the modes of the black hole, which seem to be localized at the light ring, we saw it yesterday, right? And after, uh, a time after, and actually the time is 2x0 plus this one, you can check, okay? You get something else. And the something else is the ring down of the field. Very good. There are open issues. Well, there are some important things we don't understand yet. Others we do understand. For example, it was thought or it was kind of hoped that, that it would be possible to excite resonantly the modes of a black hole. Right? For instance, you can, you can do resonant excitation of the modes of a glass right? or, or the modes of a guitar. It turns out that, you know, of course, it's hard to excite resonantly the modes of a black hole just because they are localized at the light ring. And if you think about the problem, the light ring is basically the innermost thing, structure you have in the space-time, which also means it's the highest frequency you have in the problem, right? So if you want to excite resonantly the modes of a black hole, you'd need to find something that travels at the speed of light. So you need, you need basically motion at V equals C. And this is very hard to do. It's very hard to do because matter should basically stop existing at the innermost stable circular orbit that has a lower frequency than the light ring. Okay? We do not know, well, we have done a very poor job at understanding the amplitude of the amplitude to which we excite quasi normal modes in black hole space times. Okay? We don't even know how much uh, a small infalling black hole, to which extent it's going to excite the modes of a, of a large black hole. Theoretically, I mean. Of course, we can compute the time domain waveform, but at the theoretical level, computing excitation factors uh, of black hole space times has not been done properly. So this is one item to do.
Again, noth nothing basically is known about wait time tails. Because you see, this guy is going to get a prompt contribution. He's going to get also a contribution from the potential barrier. But after that, so let me draw my observer again. X, X naught, where the initial data was. This is the barrier. So it gets prompt contribution from initial data, a quasi normal mode contribution from the barrier. Some of the fluctuations travel on, right? But there's space time curvature, so they're going to get backscattered. So some of them are going to fly back to him. And this gives you a power law, t to the minus, well, it depends on the multipolar index in this way, okay? This has not been seen in any numerical simulation of real initial data, okay? Most likely because of numerical issues, but it's something we don't understand yet. We can use this to test any alternative theory of gravity you want. Use this means we can take your favorite theory of gravity. Suppose you don't believe GR is correct, so you add some, uh, some other degree of freedom. This is going, of course, to change the way the black holes ring down, the, the way the black holes vibrate. So the idea, well, the optimal scenario would be to have a way, would be to find how the impact of changes in the theory in the quasi-normal frequencies. Because if you have this, well, I give you a black hole, I'll give you a gravitational wave detection, you measure two or three modes, you can rule out GR, and you can constrain the parameters of that theory, right? So, th so far, this has, has been done on a case-by-case on a -case analysis. And there's a reason for that. Even though the problem is linearized, I mean, it looks very simple, okay? It's really, really tough to make very generic uh, predictions about how the frequencies are going to change. In fact, we know, and I'm going to discuss in the afternoon, of examples where the change is even non-perturbative. You, you seem to add a small parameter, but the changes are, uh, well, are dramatic. And the same thing happens when you change boundary conditions, okay? So let me go, before I uh, uh, start on the boundary conditions, let me first tell you why we should even think about changing boundary conditions, and this goes to the topic of lecture four, which is about testing the black hole paradigm. It's a bit funny that, it, so I, I discovered not too long ago that Chandra Zegger was giving his uh, uh, a talk on the uh, Schwarzschild, uh, in honor of Schwarzschild in Germany, and there he said that, a confirm so of course we believe the Kerr metric should be the only stationary state of the field equations in vacuum, okay? And there should be ways to test it. Even back then, there were, well, people were starting to think about ways to test it. But Chandra Zegger made the remarkable claim that a confirmation of the metric of the Kerr spacetime, or some aspect of it, cannot even be contemplated in the foreseeable future. I think he was, he had in mind most likely, uh, you know, uh, tests using uh, gravitational fluctuations, so gravitational waves. He knew we were still some time to go before we saw something. But it's kind of interesting that three decades later, we at least have something to work on, okay? And the something to work on is the first detection here. This is, the first detection is the most interesting for me here and for you because it's so far the, the event where the final stage is more clearly seen, okay? These are 30 solar mass black holes, or objects colliding with one another, and this gives you a signal which is more clearly seen in the very late stages, right? So the question is, this is fine, this is all compatible with two black holes. Can we use, for instance, our ring down analysis to disprove any other object or not? And there's two types of claims. The first claim is, well, this has to be a black hole. It has to be a black hole because we know nothing else in the universe 
which is able to dump a signal so quickly. Because you see, this is the noisy data, right? The signal is excited, these two guys are going around each other. But then all of a sudden, everything dies so quickly. And the argument is there's nothing I know that has such a huge viscosity that will dump the signal so fast. I mean, the, you see two cycles there, or something like that, right? The other argument is, well, maybe it's not a black hole, but let me check how compact it is. It's quite easy to do a calculation. Stas uh, told you about the quadruple formula. Just using quadruple formula and energy balance, so you know the energy flux, you can equate that energy loss by the system to the uh, binding energy of the system, okay? And you get basically the the uh, evolution of the orbital frequency of your, of your binary, okay? It looks something like this. So the orbital frequency is related to the gravitational frequency, so gravitational waves are emitted at twice the orbital frequency. So the expression looks something like this, okay? Not very illuminating, but anyway. It seems, it depends only on this uh, uh, chirp mass called M, and it depends on a merger time T0, okay, which we have no access to. But given this data, LIGO and you, I mean, I, I sat down and I did the calculation by I, just using, estimating roughly frequency at two different points here before merger. You can, so you have frequency at two instants, okay? You can go here, you have two data points, you estimate T0 and call M, okay? It's quite simple. Of course, you will have some uncertainty. I got a difference of 20% with the LIGO results. But anyway, a factor 5 would be OK for me. But this is a factor 0 0.2. Huh? So you will find that the total mass of that system is of order 65 solar masses. OK, if, if, if you, there's some uncertainty. Maybe you'll find 100. Maybe you'll find 40. But that's irrelevant. So OK, we have 60 solar masses. But how much space is this mass occupying? Well, that's easy to do because you have Kepler's law, so you can relate frequency to separation. Or there's even an easier way, right? You go here, these are 0 0.05 seconds, and you see something that's repeating roughly 5 to 10 times on 0 0.05 seconds, right? So you have something doing this, and in 0 0.05 seconds, I see like five cycles. Okay? If I am very, very conservative and I assume that whatever is doing this is traveling at the speed of light, even if it's traveling at the speed of light, you get something like 500 kilometers of separation. Okay? So it's a very quick estimate to see how big the object is. So you're able to squeeze 60 solar masses in 500 kilometers. Okay? So this is what we saw. It's a very compact object indeed, and so, so, so the idea is, well, then there's really nothing else we know of. It has to be a black hole, okay? It's dark. We didn't see this guy in the electromagnetic window. It's very massive, and it's very compact, okay? And the argument then goes, well, we know nothing more massive than three solar masses that's compact and dark. There's nothing else we know like this in the universe. Therefore, it has to be a black hole. I mean, of course, there is an extra ingredient, and the extra ingredient is that we know black holes form in realistic uh, uh, situations. For example, this is an example done uh, five or six years ago. You take two neutron stars, those we've seen, okay? roughly 1.4 solar mass each of them, and you try to merge them. This is a simulation done in the uh, AEI uh, six years ago or so. And this is nice because I'm going to use a fraction of it if it plays. Let me see. Ah, very good. So densities are huge here. 
Okay, these guys exist, but they are, so if you take a spoon of this material, a teaspoon of this material, it weighs uh, as much as a mountain, okay? So it's really dense. Units are 10 to the 14 grams per cubic centimeter. But it's interesting, so as, as, as these objects start to in spiral, you'll see that there's tidal deformations, right? So the gravity of one of the objects is deforming the other, right? We can compute these numbers. We, can, we know how much they deform one another. They're pulling the other material. They're losing energy via gravitational waves, so at some point, they have to merge. There's no question about this. They could form a single neutron star, okay? And they do this if you're lucky enough, if the stars are light enough. Most of the times, you see huge tidal deformations. Most of the times, they're going to merge and do this. They are going to form. It looks white, but it's a black hole. When, okay, at the center, you now form a black hole. And all the collisions we've done so far, eventually, you may even form a, a metastable state which is a very massive neutron star at intermediate times, but eventually this all collapses to black holes. So we know black holes form. We have no other alternative, okay? So, uh, so the common law is, well, it has to be a black hole. So I'd like now to uh, indoctrinate you in why we should keep an open mind as to, this, as to what the object must be. Actually, yeah, actually, well, the reason is uh, a bit more refined than that, but I'll go there in a minute. Now, there's reasons why you should doubt, you should at least keep an open mind about why there could be something else. And the reasons are several. For example, we saw that the interior of a black hole has a diverging Kretschmann scalar, okay? So there's a singularity there. Gravitational fields are huge. We have no idea how to handle diverging gravitational fields. We need something like quantum gravity or a theory that somehow doesn't produce singularities in the interior, okay? And of course, you can ask, well, it's a huge coincidence that each time I form a singularity, I also form an horizon. Right? This is basically the essence of the censorship conjecture. But there's also another tweak to the story, which is the following. You're, you have to assume that even with the classical horizon there, this classical horizon is able to shield any possible quantum effects that are inherent to the singularity. So you have to assume that any quantum effect produced by this point-like singularity is confined to it in the horizon, okay? So this is a point number one. The point number two is that most of the objects we know come with spin. I showed you an example. You throw two black holes at one another. <clears throat> we actually saw this happening in the universe. The final state is spinning. Now, if you have a black hole which is spinning or a black hole which has some minute charge, they come with an extra ingredient. It's called a Cauchy horizon. I don't have time to go through the details. But a Cauchy horizon means that if you try to do this kind of analysis, fluctuations of the geometry, you basically can't evolve, you can't do time evolutions past that horizon. Okay? So in practice, in practice, if you throw yourself in one of these guys, I'm not going to do it. I'm fine on the outside. But if you're if you care enough about physics that you say, okay, I'm going to test this. What this means is that you are not able to predict any future, any future, any of your future. You can't predict how things are going to happen once you cross Cauchy horizons, okay? So this is a big, uh, it's a big conceptual problem, right? It's not necessarily related to quantum effects. It could be, horizons could be somehow classically unstable, we don't even know that. But in the solutions we have, they're all there. They're always there. Of course, there's other problems. Some of them are related to the horizons. I think these are minor problems. For example, the statement that we have Hawking evaporation 
because we have horizons, which may lead or not to information loss or not, okay? I think it's a minor problem in the sense that large wackles basically behave as Minkowski. This is really just equivalence principle, right? So if you take a supermassive guy, the effects that an observer feels as he crosses the horizon should be, should be basically negligible. It just use the equivalence principle. However, in 2018, we are still testing equivalence principle, okay? So, so even in that sense, testing horizons is almost like at the same footing as testing equivalence principle with the added bonus that you still are also testing whatever is inside the horizon. Carl Sagan had a very nice sentence for this that I, I love to use, which is, if you're going to tell me that you find in the universe a spot with, from which light never comes in and within which you're hiding a singularity where you know nothing of what's going on, if you're making this extraordinary claim, then I'm going to demand of you extraordinary evidence for that, okay? So I think I and you should start thinking about the evidence, quantitative evidence that you have for horizons. There's other reasons for at least trying to test the presence of horizons, but, I, but you don't even need to believe any of the crack potty statements about modified theories of gravity or resolving singularities or whatnot, okay? This, the only statement that you're given is the following. You have a detector, you have a detection, you have data. Can you quantify the compactness of the object that you saw? How compact is the object? Where is the surface of the object? Okay? This is basically what I'm interested in. And I'm going to sh try to convince you now that if you find a more sensitive detector, what you're going to be doing is basically constraining the compactness of your object to be closer and closer to that of a black hole. You can never get to the horizon to the limit. You're just approaching it. So in this sense, it's like doing particle physics, right? Better and larger accelerators are going to probe smaller and smaller distances. Very good. Actually, this was a question my mother asked me when she heard about the news. She knows nothing about science, okay? But she, she, she heard about black and she's asking me, what the hell? How do people know where is the surface of the object? How do they measure to know it's a black hole? That it's black, I can understand. We haven't seen it. Well, where is the surface, right? Now, there's a lot of questions to address. Uh, And I, I think it's fair to say that all of these are open issues, which is why I have the list here, okay? So the first question is, do we have alternatives? So we're going to need to quantify this. And for, to quantify the, the statement that we have an horizon, the easiest way is to have alternatives, because we, then we can see the differences. So the question is, do we have alternatives? And if we have them, do we know that they form dynamically just in the same way that black holes do when we collapse neutron stars? Does this happen? Are these objects stable? Because a neutron star can live for millions of years, can merge with another one and form a black hole. If I, for, if I have an alternative that lives for one second, then it's not a very good alternative to a black hole, right? So I need to make sure that it's stable. And there's some funny developments here, okay? And finally, we have seen stuff. So does the, do these alternatives look like anything like black holes if I use a telescope, uh, use a normal telescope, or if I use LIGO? Do they reproduce black holes in that sense or not? Now, the alternatives are too many to mention. I'm going to put down a few. I think I sent you a notebook also. I, I was full of notebooks. It took me a lot of trouble. <laughs> I think in one of the notebooks, I built one of the alternatives, and it's a boson star, okay? So among the, uh, I don't know, 
dozens of alternatives to black holes. Alternative means it's an object that can be massive and can be very compact, okay? The most, I think the most, one of the most attractive models are these guys. Objects that you build in a very nice, elegant theory, a theory which is well posed, we can do evolutions. Some of these objects are stable, as I'm going to discuss. We can collide them, okay? One of the examples are boson stars. You just take a minimally coupled scalar field, just the one I, I, I discussed yesterday, okay? It has a mass term, so it's massive. These scalars can form stars, okay? They form compact configurations which are bound by gravity. They don't collapse because there's pressure, there's kinetic terms uh, of pressure in the field equations, and that's why they sustain one another. There's an isotropic star, so if most of the uh, neutron star models that we have assume isotropy of the material, basically that pressure in the radial direction equals pressure in the tangential direction, okay? And this gives you the usual neutron stars. Neutron stars don't usually don't have ergo regions nor light rings, okay? So th they are not that compact. But if you add an isotropy, you can easily uh, build more compact models. Then there's, of course, all the exotica. And the exotica means you take wormholes, okay? For instance, if you find exotic material or some alternative theory of gravity, you punch a hole in the space time, you build what people call wormholes. Most of them were and are known to be dynamically unstable, okay? But still, it's an alternative that's very compact. There's graver stars, so you take a De Sitter interior, and if you're able to somehow match this to an asymptotically flat exterior, then you have what people call a graver star. So it's a, a gravitationally bound star with a De Sitter core. Okay. They can be as compact as you like, but they have big problems, like most of the guys here. The big problem being you do not have a theory from which they come. You assume you do some matching, you build a solution, but you, don't really, you can't really know the underlying theory and perform evolutions with this. Okay? People in string theory produce all sorts of things. <laughs> I'm not criticizing it, I love this. <laughs> One of them argues that black holes are just a kind of average of a large ensemble of horizonless objects. These are called fuzzballs. So you could, you could think about the horizon as the average value of some fluctuation of a large number of fields, right? Each of them has no horizon, but the average looks like a black hole. Unfortunately, we do not have any first ball construction in asymptotically flat four-dimensional space time in our universe. There are some constructions, very simple constructions, in higher dimensions. So I think all of these, by the way, are, I think, very, very exciting open issues to work on. Okay, so don't take me wrong if I, if I, if I say that string theories do all sorts of things. So there is a huge effort going on into trying to build some of these objects in four dimensions, and I think we really, really need this, okay? Some people in particular, or Java, argued that there could be, there's no fundamental reason to have the curve bound. The curve bound, if you remember, in four dimensions was a smaller or equal to m, and his argument was there's nothing in string theory that points to a special, to anything special happening at this limit. So perhaps the universe produces objects which are spinning above the curve bound and somehow the effects of the singularity are shielded in some way we don't know, okay? So we would have a quantum, a quantum object, very compact, but again, we don't really have a theory to describe this. Okay. And then there's all sorts of things, collapsed polymers, two to holes that appear in higher curvature corrections to the field equations, and so on and so forth. 
So I told you that one of the best models are boson stars. And the reason is, there's a question. Oh, yeah. Very good question. So the question is, have any of these been simulated? The answer is yes, one. <laughs> so, 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 so there's uh, really, there's decades of work here because we know really nothing. The only thing we know are boson stars. These are minimally coupled fields, scalars. We, it has a well-posed initial value problem, so we can just take the equations and evolve them. Uh, and there's an added value of, of scalar fields. Some models of dark matter actually rely on very light fields. So you see, there's motivation to even look at this stuff in other contexts. Now, before I go to the evolution, I think I have, let me check. Yes. Before I go on to the evolution of the only case we know of, there's a nice way to kind of parameterize all our ignorance, okay? There's names for this. And the names, again, crazy names, but anyway, I, I, I think I introduced one of them. But a nice way to parameterize this for, for our discussion, okay, is the following. So we're only interested in compact objects, okay? So I'm going to be measuring how much my object deviates, how much the surface of the object is distant from the, event, from the event horizon corresponding to that mass, okay? What happened? Okay, now you put this in a diagram where you have compactness and the time scale, so, or the time that it takes a photon to get from the light ring to the surface of the object, okay? Right, you see, I'm sitting at the light ring, I send this laser beam, and I measure how much time the photon hits, takes to hit the surface and get back to me. I'll tell you why this is important, okay? Now, if you use this, there's all sorts of beasts, right? Neutron, neutron stars sit somewhere here. Then you have exotic compact objects, which is everything else, okay? All of these are exotic compact objects. Basically, anything that's as compact or more compact than a neutron star, okay? If the object has a light ring, so the surface sits at the photosphere or inwards, we are going to call these ultra compact objects. And there's a reason for putting the photosphere there, okay? If, now, now comes the interesting part, glyphos, if the surface of the object is such, is at the point where, this is complicated, huh? <laughs> but so I'm at the light ring, I shine a laser beam, I measure the time it takes the laser beam to reach the surface and get back to me, okay? If this time is larger than the, ta the instability time scale of the photon orbit that we computed two classes ago, one class ago, I don't remember then I'm going to call these objects a clean photosphere object. Why is this important? Because if the surface is located so deep inside the potential well that photons take a longer time than the, than the instability time scale, for all purposes, for all dynamical purposes, these objects behave as black holes. Because you see, the response of black holes was in the light ring, right? So if you throw something at this object, this guy is going to respond at intermediate time scales exactly like a black hole, right? So this will be a clifo, like clean photosphere object. Very good. Now, do they form and do they exist? Can we evolve them? Yes? That's a good question, I'm going there. You mean in all these other objects? Yes, yes, yes. That's a good question, I'm, I, I, I'm going there. But so let me first 
tell you that we know <clears throat> that some of these objects form, they grow, and they grow to be compact. This is one example. Boson stars have been around, you know, since the 40s or 50s. Kaup built the first solution in 68. And I sh I'm showing you here an example of what, uh, of what we did, okay? You take a scalar field, so really, you only have kinetic term in the action plus a mass term. This is it, okay? Plus, of course, the Einstein uh, term. And you let this guy go. So you, you do the following. You build an initial profile, it's Gaussian, for the scalar field, and you evolve. These are the initial conditions, and you let it go, okay? So this is what happens. This is field as a function of position, and this is energy density as a function of position, okay? You let the field go. You see that the field oscillates more or less wildly, okay? It has a frequency. Actually, the frequency in all of these stars is dictated by the mass of the field, okay? Uh, but the energy density actually is roughly stationary, okay? These are real fields. I mean, this is really a simple theory, okay? The name of these objects is not really boson stars. People call it oscillotons because they oscillate slightly. If you put a, a complex field or two scalar fields, you're able to build a truly stationary solution, and that's boson stars, okay? Now, you can start playing around with this, and you can build, you can find all the stationary solutions and build a mass radius diagram in the same way that you do for neutron stars, okay? This is the mass radius diagram, okay? And you see the following. Stars, boson stars with a large radius, so very large guys, okay, are very dilute. They're Newtonian objects almost, okay? But then as the mass grows, so this is mass here, this is radius in some units, okay? As the mass grows, the, the radius decreases. So the compactness of these objects is increasing. This is for a scalar, this is for a massive vector, okay? Actually, I think two months ago, a similar diagram was done for massive tensors. So they exist as well, okay? These solutions. These boson stars with only this term are never as compact as to be Yuko. So they never have a light ring, okay? If you add self-interaction terms here, phi to the four, phi to the six, and so on, you easily build a boson star which has a light ring. Okay, so this is easy to do. So the question is, sure, it's fine to build this diagram, but if I let the field go, is it going to form a star which lies here or here? Is it going to be very dilute or not? Okay? We don't know this, but we know the following. If I take two stars here, so I take one star with this radius and this mass, and I collide it with another star, these stars are going up the mass radius diagram, okay? The mass is larger, so they are going this way. And we found something interesting. We and other people found the following. If, you, if your star is sitting here and it decretes a small amount of scalar field, okay, you would expect something nasty to happen because, well, this is the maximum mass, okay? To the left of this diagram, usually in neutron stars, usually, the star is unstable, and it collapses to a black hole, okay? So you'd expect that if you're sitting here with a star and it eats a bit more material, it's going to collapse to a black hole, right? The mass cannot grow, it's at the peak, so it has to do something else. The funny thing, and this is shown actually in this movie, these are two such stars. The total mass of this system is larger than the maximum possible mass, okay? What we saw instead is that there is no black hole formation. The two stars just release a huge amount of scalar field, and they sit down eventually right close to the maximum mass point. So the idea is a star grows by accretion, okay, and at the very late stages, it's basically hanging over this maximum mass point. Okay? So this is a nat it seems like a natural way to build compact configurations. Very good. And now to the big question, are these objects stable or not? 
By the way, all or almost all the things that I'm saying now, you can study them using the tools of the last two classes or the notebooks, okay? Stability is just to linear stability analysis in exactly the way I described, okay? Now, there was an inter... inter yes? So, in boson star case... Yes, okay, so that's a good point. How much massive are we talking about? So the mass, the maximum mass of a boson star depends on the mass of the field with which it's made of, okay? So if you take a field with, uh, with a mass 10 to the minus 9 electron volt, for example, then you're able to build a star which roughly is one solar mass, okay? So if you want to build a galaxy, then you're, you're talking about fields of 10 to the minus 21 electron volt or so. So, you, of course, actually, the question is very good because this takes us to another item which I, 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 I didn't even write down, which is the following. So, okay, I want to mimic, I want to build a boson star that looks like a one solar mass wackle, okay? And then for that, you tell me, ah, oh, yeah, there is in the universe a field with a mass mu equal to 10 to the minus 9 electron volt, let's say, okay? And then, that's fine, I will build a one solar mass object that looks like a black hole. The problem is that we have seen dark and compact objects across nine orders of magnitude in mass, right? The mass radius diagram of black holes looks something like this. So I need to be able to produce, I need to have a theory that gives me something that looks like this phase diagram, right? It can't be this one is not good enough because maybe it mimics this guy, but it doesn't mimic this. So I need a theory that does this for me. And we don't know this yet, okay? You see what I mean? Maybe you, maybe you mimic a one solar mass object, but then you're going to lose the 10 to the 6 object that we see in the center of galaxies. So this is still a big problem. Now, the stability of these objects is an interesting uh, issue. A few years ago, three years ago, actually this should, this should be published 2015, Joe Kerr showed the following. If you take any object, any compact object, okay, and if the object has a light ring, so it's more compact than 3M, Okay, right? Then if you kick the object, so you, you do this to the object, then the fluctuation, the wave that you produced, will live on on time scales that are never smaller than one over log of t, okay? So they live for a very, very long time. This is the point, okay? And his argument then was, well, then we can show using energy arguments that if a, a fluctuation lives longer than or as much as 1 over log of t, then nonlinearities will pile up and destroy the object, okay? So there's a strong, there's strong reasons to believe that objects which have light rings are nonlinearly unstable, okay? I think this answers some of your non-linearly, okay? These are non-linear arguments. Actually, there's a funny, uh, uh, Joe told me he was visiting Lisbon and he told me that this result was known in Minkowski space-time. If you try to trap light in a maze, so this is a maze, okay? If you try to trap light here, then exactly the same decay, yeah, exactly the same thing happens. So light will leave the maze at a pace no faster than one over log of t. So in the end, it's like the light ring really works as, as a trapping point in your space time, okay? Very good. We don't really know what ha what's, what's going to drive the, the instability. We don't really even know the end state. Some conjectures are that the star is going to collapse because the, the, the linear modes look like look like cylinders, 
And there's a mechanism called the Dyson Chandrasekhar Fermi mechanism that should basically disrupt the star. This is nonlinear. If you want rotation to a very compact object, you're going to do exactly the same thing that you do with Kerr. You're going to produce ergo regions, okay? The problem with ergo regions is that they have negative energy states there, okay? And let me tell you why this is a problem. If you throw a wave into a curve locale, the wave is going to enter the ergo region. It has a negative energy there, okay? So this is the ergo region of curve. It's going to enter here, so I throw a wave. It has energy smaller than zero here, okay? But negative energy states are not allowed in flat space time, okay? So when the wave leaves the ergo, if it leaves the ergo region, it has to come up with a positive energy, okay? This could be a problem, right? Because if there were no, with the horizon, it's fine. This negative energy state can go in, and that's the end of it. Actually, this is why black holes radiate, right? Hawking radiation is really just a negative energy state inside the horizon, okay? In curved black holes, this is fine. The wave enters here, negative energy dumps into the hole. If you, take, if you remove the horizon, then you have a big problem. Because now, you have a wave that's sitting inside the region with a negative energy. The wave is going to travel to the origin. There's a huge centrifugal barrier there. It's going to be reflected. And it wants to live. What happens if it leaves the negative energy region? It has to live with the positive energy, right? It can't. Energy is conserved. So what happens is when the wave hits the ergo region boundary, it leaves behind a state which has even larger energy, larger negative energy, right? So you see what you're doing. You're actually creating an instability, right? So this is called the ergo region instability. Is a, the arguments were put forward a long time ago by Friedman, but uh, recently Machidis gave a really nice mathematical rigorous argument for the instability. So any object with an ergo region and no horizon is going to be linearly unstable, okay? So my conclusion from this would be most likely if you try to compactify an object and produce uh, light rings in the space time, then the space time is unstable, okay? And many people would be concerned with this. I am not very concerned because I am also unstable, okay? My lifetime is around, I hope, 100 years. <laughs> Most likely, much less. <laughs> but still, that's not a reason why I shouldn't be here, right? So this to tell you that instability by itself is not a big issue. The time scale is the issue. We need to know time scales. We don't know time scales, okay? We know nothing about time scales for this problem. So this is a big to-do list. So finally, I think I have still 10 minutes. Let me tell you a little bit about how these objects can or cannot mimic black holes, okay? So let me start by telling you that Hawking radiation is, of course, something that looks very unique to uh, space times with horizons. It's not, okay? If you add a, a bit of dynamics to the space time, you always produce mixing of modes. So you always, you're always able to at least mimic some of the features of Hawking radiation. So very compact objects, which are even slightly dynamical, they will also emit radiation. And there's a nice work by Padmanaban showing that it's even thermal in some stages, okay? So it's not exclusive of, uh, of black holes. What about imaging? There's telescopes, they can look at, uh, at the space time and they seem to form an image. One of the examples is this one. This is how, so this is how a black hole surrounded by a, an accretion torus, okay? And this, this, these events happen, would look like to a telescope. What's going on? Okay. This is how it would look like to a telescope, for example, the Event Horizon Telescope, okay? The luminosity would look brighter here just because 
the, the black hole is spinning in this direction, so there's beaming of light here, okay? Right, and Doppler shifting that makes this fraction look more luminous. This is how the, your telescope would trace the image of the torus. These are 95% level drawings, okay? Curved black hole surrounded by a torus. This is exactly the same thing, but you replace the black hole by a boson star. It's a spinning boson star, roughly with the same mass, with a slightly different spin. Well, the frequency is here, that's not relevant, okay? And you could tell me, well, wait a minute, this looks different, right? Because a boson star has no horizon, some photons cross through the center. Some of those photons are here. But for any observation that we're going to have in the next 40 years, there's no way a telescope is going to, separate, to distinguish this from this guy. There is no way. The resolution is just too bad, and the, uh, the, uh, the model dependency that we, that we have in accretion disks or torus are just way too large to be able to discriminate these two pictures, okay? Now, there was an interesting proposal a few years back to really distinguish black holes from any other object. The argument was really nice, okay? The argument was the following. Most of the black holes in the universe are surrounded by accretion disks, okay? Matter is here. This is the ISCO. You remember there's nothing within the ISCO. And then matter falls. Occasionally it falls, it's being accreted. Okay? And the argument was the following. I look at the center of our galaxy, okay? I see a dark spot, and I see a very dim accretion disk here. Okay? Automatically, this is a proof that black holes exist. Why? Because, well, accretion disks have been here for millions of years. Whatever is here has been here for millions of years. Matter is falling into the object, it surely must have gained thermodynamical equilibrium, right? So whatever goes in must come out. It must reach some equilibrium, right? So you throw a photon, but after millions of years, this guy gives, is giving back what's getting in, okay? And because we don't see any right spot here, this is basically ruling out any alternative, okay? Now, the problem of this type of argument is, one, it assumes that whatever is coming out is always coming out in the electromagnetic window, okay? So this is a minor issue. But I think a bigger issue is gravitational lensing. It's lensing of whatever is coming out. If you take an object which is very compact, so, so let, me, let me do this experiment. I'm an observer falling to a compact object, and I'm throwing light rays all over, isotropically, okay? If I'm here, so at 6M, this would be the ISCO of a Schwarzschild black hole, then all the photons shot in these directions escape the central object, okay? But as you get closer, then the opening angle gets much tighter, okay? So if I'm close to the surface, then basically, all of the photons that I sent, so all of the photons sent, sent within this direction are going to fall back. In fact, the opening cone, so if I'm sitting here, and only photons shot within this cone of aperture delta will escape, and delta is basically equal to epsilon where my surface is at 2m, 1 plus epsilon. Okay? So very compact objects, very small epsilon, very small opening angle. Almost all of the light that the object tries to emit gets back into the object. There's no way you can reach thermodynamic equilibrium. Okay? Very good. So finally, I think I still have five minutes. Okay. Gravitational wave signal. So we have seen gravitational waves. There's at least four different ways we can test black holes. The answer, by the way, is, let me give you already the final punchline. We do not know what object that is. It's compatible with anything 
that has that is a clefoil. Anything that has a surface deep inside the light ring explains all of LIGO observations, okay? So far. So we need a lot more work and a lot more detections to actually put more meaningful constraints. But let me tell you what you can do, okay? So you have two objects, they're in spiraling. As you saw in the neutron star case, they are going to tidally deform one another. So one of the things you can do is, well, let me see how much black holes distort one another. You can measure this, you can compute this for the Earth, it was done 100 years ago, by a guy called Love, okay? And Love quantified the deformation of bodies using something that we call tidal love numbers. A tidal love number of a black hole is computed in the zero frequency limit of all the equations we wrote down. So it's a really, really simple calculation, okay? You basically just impose, so you take a star, your star is sitting here, or a black hole, whatever, and you want to measure how much that star, which at zero order is at rest, how much it's going to deform this guy, okay? In our language, in the language we used yesterday, this is basically the same as requiring, as looking for static fluctuations. So you set omega equals to zero, okay? We saw, the conclusion that we saw was that there was no hair. There were no possible static fluctuations in black hole spacetimes. But remember, there were no possible static fluctuations which were regular, okay? Now, what you're going to be looking at is a fluctuation that at large distances looks like the field produced by this guy, okay? Right, so it's irregular. We know it grows, it grows like R to the L, okay? And you basically then can use, it's very simple, it's a one-line equation, okay? But the end result is that the tidal of numbers of black holes are zero. It's a remarkable result in GR, okay? You, you, they can move, you can change the, ch the, the shape of black holes, but that doesn't change the way the black hole affects gravitationally nearby objects. They are zero. They're the only objects we know with zero tidal deformability, okay? So a simple way to test if the object is a black hole is looking at gravitational wave data and estimate the tidal of numbers of the objects there, right? In the same way, so if you have two guys which are spinning or not spinning, if they are not curved black holes, they are going to be something else. This means that all of the multipolar moments of this object, curved black holes are deformed, right? If you make an object spinning, it's not spherically symmetric. It has a multipolar gravitational field, which is non-trivial, okay? And that's going to affect the other black hole or the other object in a different way, and you can test this with gravitational waves. But since we discussed so much ring down, let me tell you how we can use, how we should use ring down to test the nature of the final object, okay? So this is our ring down. We merge two guys, two black holes. They always produce ring down. In fact, we know it's, it's coming from the light ring. So there's something trivial you know has to happen if instead of a black hole here, so instead of your space time being vacuum all the way to the left, if you put a surface here, okay, the waves that you generate when your object crosses the light ring have to hit the surface and they have to give you some signal, okay? Right? So if you think about the uh, photosphere as this wall, right? Whenever a star crosses this wall, it produces a burst of radiation. This is this burst, right? This burst, okay? But now, if there's a surface, if there's nothing there, the burst that went in is lost forever, right? And you see basically this, nothing, okay? If there's a surface there, you expect at least a fraction of that burst to hit you back, to come back, cross the light ring, and into the detector. So you expect echoes of the original signal. And this is, in fact, what you get, okay? If you plot the effective potential for a black hole, it looks like this. A star crosses the peak, this is the light ring, 
burst of radiation, a fraction into the horizon, a fraction into LIGO. If you have a boson star, a wormhole, a compact star, whatever, the burst that you generated in the light ring, a fraction goes to LIGO, a fraction goes in, but now it's not lost forever, right? It hits the surface of the object, it comes back, a fraction escapes the ergo region, the uh, photosphere hits the detector again. So you're going to get a series of echoes of the original signal. This is here. So black line is black hole waveform. Red line is a wormhole signal. Okay, a wormhole that has a light ring that's very, very compact. You basically get copies of the original burst at later times. Okay? I think I'm out of time, but let me tell you just very quickly that these bursts, wait, 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 were claimed to be seen in LIGO data last year. Actually, they were claimed to be uh, uh, present in LIGO data at a very high significance very recently, okay? The model that was used to do the searches was roughly okay. This was a study by Nyayash Afshordi. The analysis was more or less verified by LIGO groups, but the significance was lower than was claimed, okay? There's still something in the data, but way too low to have any significance to claim detection, okay? So the modeling of the signal is something we need to worry about. We don't know how to model properly these compact objects because we don't have the objects, right? The thing that went less well in their analysis was the estimate of random fluctuations that look like repeating signals, okay? And this is what gives a lower significance to the detection. And I think I'll stop here, so maybe we'll continue in the afternoon.